Welcome to IJ Forum. I'm Dick Spotswood, politics and government columnist for the Marin Independent Journal. Today our topic is SMART, the Sonoma Marin Area Rail Transit Agency. SMART has been in the eye of many people in these two counties of Marin and Sonoma for a good 25 years. The dream was to build a commuter line connecting Sonoma to Marin. The major market would be commuters people that lived in Sonoma and worked in Marin. Some of them who would get to the Larkspur Ferry would go on to San Francisco. In 2008, that dream became a reality when Marin voters and Sonoma voters jointly passed Measure Q, a one quarter cent sales tax to fund construction of SMART and operation, which would start hopefully this year. Construction is essentially complete, but operation is going to be delayed probably until mid-2017. Here to discuss SMART, its present status, and what we can expect in SMART as we go forward is the general manager of the agency, Farhad Mansourian. Farhad is an engineer who was previously director of public works for the county of Marin, and now he's general manager, head guy, at SMART. And uh, you've got a line that's basically finished. Greetings, thank you for having us. Yes, the construction is done. We have rebuilt 43 miles of tracks 42 bridges, including one major bridge over Petaluma River, which we, by the way, bought from Texas. We bought a used bridge, and Dick, you were out there I looking at indeed. it. We wanted to save taxpayers' money, and we saved over 10 million by buying a used bridge. We brought it uh, on a train to Napa County, painted it, and refurbished it, and then now it's uh, installed on Petaluma River Bridge. It's a movable bridge. Yeah. In the old days, that bridge would take 15 minutes to turn and let a boat go through or a train go through. Now that bridge moves at 110 seconds. And we can have a uh, you know, freight train as well as passenger train go over it at something like 45 miles an hour. Farhad, I had the uh, ability, thanks to, you, to your staff, to ride uh, one of the smart trains, the new cars. And they're great. They look great. They sound great. Mm -hmm. They're very comfortable, like the snack bar. Uh, you should have Wi-Fi, I urge you to have Wi-Fi. We uh, will. Oh, you're going to have Wi-Fi? Cor correct. Great. Um, but I was expecting a, a, a Christmas, New Year's trip on SMART as a paying passenger this year. It's not going to happen. Correct. For us, um, we had to really think hard because of something that took place in Canada. As you know, uh, Canadian Rail um, paid SMART $750,000 and took the design and exactly our car and bought some of these cars, actually 18 of them, because they wanted to have their rail extension to their airport. And they started two years ago. So as our sister agency using exactly the same design, same manufacturer, we've been keeping track of any issues that they've been having or any lessons learned. And in July this year, one of their engines only after two years had a complete failure, which is very unusual. It took the manufacturer, Cummings, Cummings is an American, one of the best engine companies in the world, few weeks to determine why this engine failed. And in September, we were notified by our car manufacturer that there was a design flaw in the engine and the crankshaft had completely broken. So what we had to face with is knowing that your engine can fail at any time. Should we take a risk, open our doors, and then what? If we now have uh, passenger service and now these engines start failing. Because the safety of the passengers are absolute paramount for us and we want to be reliable and dependable, um, the position that SMART, the board of directors took is no, safety first. And then we have negotiated with the manufacturer. They're going to replace every single one of these engines. As we speak today in November 1st, by mid-November, they have produced the correct parts and they have come out with the new engines. And each weekend, by end of November, we will be replacing one of those engines, which we have 14 engines, and it's going to take that long to do it. All right, here's my question. I, sure. I get the need for the replacement. You don't want to have a glitch on the line and it, it just it start off on the bad foot. Get it, get it right to start with. I get that. But in an aeroport, when there's an engine that's gone bad in a plane, they can take off and change an engine 24 hours. Right. Why not put, bring, have Cummings or whoever's going to do it, have them come out, do it, get it done, bang, 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 instead of taking, you know, months and months to get it done. Why not so, expedite the process? Very good question. So in order for us to do that, that, that means for two months or a month and a half, we have to stop testing 
and we have to do everything that we've been doing last few months, throw that away, and now have to start all over again. And that will delay us much, much more. So the best way to do it is to continue running the train as we are right now, seven days a week, so we can test the signals and make sure the latest technology, hardware, software is working well, while each weekend we're gonna be replacing one of those engines. Also, we want that engine that is replaced and, and they assure us it's the, it's the good engine now. We wanna test those. And by doing a wholesale 14 of them and then open our doors, now we don't know if these new engines are gonna work. We like to test them one at a time and keep running those engines and make sure the fix is permanent without jeopardizing our passenger safety. The other thing you're doing, which is great, but, it, but, it, but it, I, I have a hunch, and I'm gonna ask you if I'm right, that it's part of the reason for the delay, is the positive train control system that you're doing. I think you're gonna be maybe the first line to start off with positive train control. And for the, for the viewers, positive train control is the state of the art that's gonna the, prevent the disaster Amtrak had when the train went too fast, if something happens to the engine, basically, We've, we've got to a 21st century stage where we can control trains automatically. So let's but it's, off, it's not off the shelf, it's brand new. Is that part of the delay? Uh, it's really the signal testing system, but what you said is very correct. So let's, let's take a minute and talk about positive train control. Okay. Before positive train control, you have an engineer who is told, hey, you need to go this slow or you need to go only this fast. When you come to an intersection, you do these things. Everything was relied on that engineer. In our words, was human enforced. If there was a human error or a criminal act, then an accident can take place. And some of the real disasters have been that the engineer was going too fast, was texting, and was not looking that there is a car stuck on the track. Many of those things were human error. So Congress has now passed a law and by 2018, every rail agency in the United States must have positive train control. It is not an off-the-shelf technology you buy. You have to develop a software, the equipment, and the hardware, and the testing. So what does positive train control, PTC, will do? We will build into the system how fast you can go, how slow you must go, what is the speed when you come out of a station or go into the station? We'll detect that there are two, two, in, two uh, trains coming at each other. Any one of those conflicts or violations. So if you're an engineer and you exceed the speed limit that you've been told by two miles an hour, more than two seconds, the system will go into an alarm, will give you five seconds to correct or the system will bring you to a stop. That's how we prevent accidents as a result of human error. The accident that just happened in New Jersey, the accident that has happened yes. in life, every single one of those could be preventable with positive train control. It's not off the shelf though. No. So this that means is it's subject to glitches. A lot of testing. So okay. we have to, so to give you an idea, we have a company who's designing the software. Then it's the GE, now it's Alston who has to develop that hardware, and then we have to put both of those into our trains and test them. And not test them to be good, not test them to be very good. We are testing them to be perfect every single time. Okay, and we I, felt we're not there yet. When can I expect to get on the train and pay a fare? You know, we are looking at late spring and of 2017. It could be a little sooner, it could be a little later, based on the testing. We don't want to open our doors one minute sooner than we are safe. All right, this is, this is all technical stuff. The folks in, in San Rafael and some folks in Novato, uh, we've been getting at the IJ calls from these fellows and emails and stuff saying, the horns. Now, I've raised in the San Francisco area. My wife was raised in the peninsula. The Caltrain's been going up and down the peninsula for 100 years. Nobody says a word about the horns. But we haven't had trains in this area forever. What can you do about the horns? So, you know, we haven't exactly, as you said, for 50, 60 years, we haven't had any train, so no horns. Now, we have to sound the horns because of the federal law. We have no choice. Having said that, 
The federal law also gives municipalities a process known as quiet zone, which once they follow that process, then we as the passenger service are obligated not to blow our horn with the exception of emergencies on the track. Oh, so based on leadership of Mayor Phillips of Novato and his cooperation with the city of, uh, I'm sorry, of San Rafael, Mayor Phillips of San Rafael, and cooperation with City of Novato and County Marin, we are going, they're going through the process of having quiet zone that will begin from north of Novato all the way to downtown San Rafael. At this point, I think the best estimate is around end of February or March in that mm -hmm. timeline. And once that takes place and we have finished testing, but for sure, by the time we begin passenger service, then we will not be blowing our horn. And again, federal government needs to approve that unless our engineer sees an emergency that they must blow the horn. I, I so relief is. is around the corner. Have patience with us, but we're going through very crucial testing period that we must make sure not only our equipment is working, but we want to make sure you and the pedestrian and the bicyclist, everybody knows there is a train in town and we cannot come to a quick stop. Safety, safety, safety. It seems to be one of the one of the fundamental problems you have is the fact that there hasn't been a train for so long. Correct. And in the old days, people were used to it. Uh, in Southern Marin, we had electric commuter trains. In Central Marin, we had electric commuter trains. It was part of life. But the folks who knew that, they're gone. And the new folks don't know. How do you educate them? You know, um, we have done what I think is a terrific community outreach. To give you an example, I reported to our board of directors two weeks ago that we now have uh, surpassed educating 25,000 kids one at a time from K to high school. And with the hope of newspapers, televisions, radio, community outreach, and any social club, We've been giving a lot of speech asking people, please don't stop on the track. Please don't try to beat those gates as they're coming down. Don't try to go under them. A train at 79 miles an hour will take one mile to stop. I don't think folks understand that it doesn't stop on a dime. We don't. Unfortunately, it's just not physically possible. it is just, and so please don't stop on the track. Look ahead of you. And if you see that the track, you could be stuck on a track, wait that extra 30 seconds. Your life is worth a lot more than try to beat the gate because it's all electronically controlled. And even if the engineer sees you, he, he or she might not be able to stop. So it is very, very important for you to take an extra 10, 30 seconds and be safe. All right, the other day I was down by the Larkspur Cinema prowling around the track to join my wife, the new bicycle bridge across the uh, Sir Francis Drake. And I said, here's where the train's going to stop in Larkspur. But I didn't tell her when it would stop there. When are you going to get the train to Larkspur? We are beginning uh, our, that process um, as follow. In spring, we're going to take the contract, hopefully around spring, to our board of directors to award a contract. Spring this year? Spring 2017. Seven, we are looking into starting construction by summer 2017, finish a year later, 2018, do testing for three, four months, and open up by end of 2018. Easy for Marin County people to ask you about Larkspur. I'm going to represent our folks up at Sonoma. Windsor, when do we get to Windsor? We are looking into going to Windsor as soon as we're able to come up with another 40 some million dollars. Why so much to go that three miles? Because bridges are expensive and we have bridges. That's really what it is. And you know, even though people think tracks are there, these I tracks know. have not been used for decades. And the new fast train that we have, the seismic retrofit, the requirements of positive train control means that we need to gut everything out and build from ground up. As you know, Marin County people tend to be a little dubious about smart, but Sonoma people are excited. If they have any frustration, they want it to get going and they want it to go as far north as possible. So when you get to Windsor, maybe start looking for uh, Hillsburg? Absolutely. Our goal is to get to Windsor and as soon as we're, I'm going to give ourselves one day off, 
But once we get to Windsor, or at least the money is there to go to Windsor, then our next stop was going to be Hillsburg, and but, then ultimately Cloverdale. That is our mandate. Well, since the station was built at Cloverdale 20 years ago, it's time. Now, you guys did do it, but a highway relocation project, the Cloverdale folks are, are, are waiting for the train. And, and we feel committed. We must go to Cloverdale, and we must go to Larkspur. And that's the mandate. That's the direction of our board. And we're working very hard looking under any possible grant in the federal government. Look at it this way, Dick. Who would think that a project will have funding by the president of the United States? Our funding to go to Larkspur was shown by the president of the United States in his budget. But because White House recognized this is an important link and on his budget, never happened in my lifetime that president has come out with a specific budget for any project in Marin. And we got that funding. And then thanks to Metropolitan Transportation Commission, who came out with the other half. That's why going to Larkspur is now completely um, on its way. Well, Farhad, I'm looking forward to uh, spring of 2017. I want to be on that first train. And uh, I want to thank you and Smart Board for having you here today and it being part of IJ Forum. Farhad Mansouri, and General Manager of the Sonoma Marin Area Rail Transit District. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Farhad. Welcome back to IJ Forums. I'm Dick Spotswood, government and politics columnist for the Marin Independent Journal. Our topic is SMART today, uh, its future, where it is today, and what's going to happen. Ever since SMART was a, a glimmer in the eye of uh, transit advocates in Marin and Sonoma County, uh, our next guest, Mike Arnold, uh, has been a critic of uh, the SMART process and the idea of uh, rail passenger service from an economic point of view in the North Bay. Uh, our first guest was Farhad Mansurian, General Manager of the Sonoma Marin Area Rail Transit District. Uh, Farhad was invited to be a co-guest with Mike, which is our normal Farhad, a normal uh, format, uh, but Farhad declined uh, and preferred to uh, be separate from Mike and go his own way. Uh, Farhad's belief was that since Mike is not a transit expert or transit professional, it would simply be a, a, a political debate. He didn't want to get into that. Uh, but we want to get into Mike Arnold and know what he's thinking. That's why we've asked him to be here today. And, uh, Mike, everybody knows, or most people that follow transit know, uh, that SMART was promised to be open uh, in, by, by the end of the year, 2016. Uh, but right now we know that it's probably going to open six months later. Well, what do you know about it, and what's your thoughts? Well, first of all, the SMART proposed uh, in 2008 that it would be starting years ago. 2014? Uh, to, to, 2008, they said it would be in 2014, so it was a two-year delay. They always said it would be the end, by the end of 2016. Now they're saying it's after they, they repair the, these uh, train engines for the, for the defect. And the real question is they don't have a lot of credibility, so will they start up? I Actually, I don't know whether they will or they won't. We'll find out. One of the things that, uh, uh, that you've written to me about and talked about and written in the paper about has dealt with the transit center in, uh, in San Rafael, uh, named after Paul Bettini, a Golden Gate Bridge director and uh, a former San Rafael mayor of the Bettini Transportation Center now is a bus facility. Uh, it's kind of kitty corner from where the old railroad station is, now the Whistle Stop building. And from what I understand, they're going to have to move the Bettini Transportation Center. What's your thoughts on that? Well, well first of all, one of the key issues identified in the environmental impact report that was done in 2006 were traffic impacts in downtown Santa Fe. And people are already experiencing them with the at-grade crossings coming down. And if the at-grade crossings start coming down on 2nd and 3rd, the traffic impacts will be significant. And one of the questions that's really up for grabs by the City Council of San Rafael is exactly how do they evaluate the question regarding the interim plan for the Bettini Center because it is going to create a good deal of disruption. According to Golden Gate Transit, Bettini Center gets 9,000 users a day. According to SMART, in 2025, according to its ridership model that it used in, uh, and published in the EIR, it will only generate 400 
riders a day that would use downtown San Rafael. So there's this question of costs and benefits which have always been there regarding the train, which is this is a very expensive system. They've already spent $570 million on the system. It is going to generate very few riders. That's always been the problem with the train. And now in San Rafael, it is going to worsen traffic uh, congestion significantly and what the city council needs to do is a very careful independent evaluation of what happens what are the consequences to central Marin County residents if in fact they provide the uh, the rights for smart to extend the rail south they don't have to they have land use law right now that trumps whether or not SMART can go south, and they can execute that law according to the city attorney. So we know, you know that we're not to debate SMART's whether or not it should be built in the first place. It's built, the money's spent, it's running, it's there. The question is where we go to the future. And my question to you, Mike, is, so are you saying don't go to Larkspur? Absolutely. Uh, the, the EIS for... Explain what it the, is. Uh, the environmental impact statement that was done for the feds before they got the before they got the 40 million dollars from between the feds and the MTC showed that the extension to Larkspur only generates 131 riders a day 40 million dollars for 131 riders on a concept to an economist like myself that seems like a really bad buy it is a lot of money to be spent on something that is likely to generate more traffic congestion on second and third, potentially backing up cars onto Highway 101 during the congested peak hours. And to the extent that they do that, they are going to create far more congestion than any riders that they're ever going to take to, uh, to near the Larkspur Ferry. If they didn't go to the Larkspur Ferry, how would you get the riders to the Larkspur Ferry? The ridership on the Larkspur Ferry has been increasing. People are getting to the Larkspur Ferry. They're largely driving. Some of them are taking buses. And that's how they're getting to the Larkspur Ferry. And it is apparent that based on SMART's most recent ridership model, SMART's not going to contribute to that. And since it's not going to contribute to that, the real question is, is given that it is going to impact downtown San Rafael and potentially the key political issue that Marin County residents care about, which is traffic, to the extent that they back cars onto Highway 101, the morning traffic coming southbound on 101 will be significantly impacted, just like the evening traffic on 101 northbound would be impacted if those cars back up onto the freeway. Okay, Smart's going to open. You, you, uh, some time ago, when the uh, it was an effort to repeal the sales tax, and as you recall, it failed. Right. And I remember speaking to you, and you said, "Well, I accept it's going to be finished. It's going to be built." So I'm going to ask you questions about going forward right now. And you follow the situation pretty closely. What mitigation measures would you suggest that SMART's not following to help traffic in downtown San Rafael? Well, the first thing we need to do is to understand what the traffic impacts are. And here's the good news. If SMART actually starts train service in the spring, we'll be able to go down to the downtown San Rafael smart station and we can count the number of people getting on and off trains maybe it's 400 maybe it's 500 maybe it's maybe it's more but the point is the city council of san rafael which has authority over deciding exactly what to do with the patini center they need the information so they can weigh wait a minute smart is absolutely coming into downtown san rafael but the station is north of 3rd, and it is a very big deal to allow that train to cross 2nd and 3rd. And finishing SMART does not necessarily mean taking it all the way to Larkspur. It, it, the EIR, uh, in regard to the San Rafael Transportation Center, did the EIR predict that the Transportation Center would need to be moved? No. It, did, it not only did, what it did was it said there would be a, significant traffic increases in downtown San Rafael, which could be mit mitigated by modern traffic control technology. But at, at this point, given how close it is uh, to the city council making decisions about what to do with the Bettini Center, it seems to me it's incumbent upon them 
to get that information, to do a very careful traffic study as to what does it mean to their residents to have that train cross second and third. Those are major arteries and those at-grade crossings are already causing delay up and down the corridor and to the extent that they might generate more delay than the riders that would actually take the train to Larkspur, maybe we need to put a hold on the idea of the train going to Larkspur until we can figure out, well, if it is going to Larkspur, how do we address the traffic mitigation? How do we address the traffic problems it's going to create? And right now, we don't have a good assessment of what those traffic problems are. I can tell you that uh, uh, to defend a little bit the current management, mm -hmm. Farhad Mansourian and the current board, I recall when I was first told in an interview when they'd have to move the Bettini Transportation Center and the general manager was Lillian Hames. Mm -hmm. And um, I was incredulous that they were going to have to move it. And I later learned that it hadn't been coordinated with Golden Gate Transit. It really wasn't so much about auto traffic. It wasn't operational for bus transit. That's right. And so it, it's so just blame goes where blame goes. I just want to give uh, the current management a little bit of pass yeah, on there, that. There, there, put, it, put it this way. There is a lot of inherited defects in the entire SMART project that the current management has inherited from what politicians did in 2008 to mislead voters into thinking that a quarter cent sales tax would be able to fund a seven, and operate a 70-mile train when they were told, as you've written in your own columns, they were told by consultants prior to 2006 that a quarter cent sales tax was not enough for this train. And, but polls showed they couldn't pass a half cent sales tax, and so they opted for a quarter cent sales tax, and what the public has ended up with is half a train system. It has not gone all the way to Cloverdale. They don't have many parking spaces. They don't have shuttles, all of which were things that they promised in the EIR. And as a consequence, you have a train system in suburbia where there is very little way to get to the train station because there's very few parking spaces. And there's very little way for people who take the train for commuting purposes to get to where they need to go. And this has been the inherited defect in the entire plan. This was what we said in 2006. This is what, why Hal Brown would not endorse the uh, 2008 sales tax measure. It was because there was no way to get people to where they needed to go. And so all of the models regarding ridership showed that you would end up spending an enormous sum of money and generate very few riders. And the whole point of the system is to get people to use the train. But in, in the modern era, they have to have a way to get to the train station, which means if you look at BART, most people in the suburbs taking BART into San Francisco, they are driving their cars and parking in the BART parking lots. And when they get to San Francisco, they are walking to their jobs because it's a high density employment center. Marin nor Sonoma has a high employment a high density employment center and as a consequence the ridership is tiny and that's why the ridership in their 214 EIS in the projections that they made for this 40 million dollar expenditure showed it was only over a little bit over a hundred riders a day. I have a little different take for you yeah. now. Let me just yeah. give you a thought. I, I, people who I've, I, you know I've served as a councilman. Sometimes you get elected to council and you oppose the plan that your predecessors uh, adopted. And now all of a sudden you're elected and your job is to make that plan work. I mean, that's just the reality of being a city councilman or a county supervisor or any kind of administrative, elected administrative post. Let's just say that the uh, county of Marin said, Mike Arnold, we're pointing you to the smart board. Knowing what you know, what would you do to make the system work better? Well, the first thing I do is recognize that you got to think about how this train is going to operate over time. They do not have enough money, enough revenues from the sales tax to pay both the debt service that they've already committed to and to provide the rail services they've promised consistently. But which, means, which means when a recession occurs, their revenues are going to decline because the sales tax goes down when 
a recession occurs. And they're going to lose fair revenues, which means they're going to have one large operating deficit. They claim they have enough, re they claim they have enough reserves. We're going to find out. But to the extent that they don't, they're going to be forced by their budgets to cut service. And if I was on the smart board, I would say, you need to plan for that now. How would you do it? Well, the first thing is, is to look at the schedule of the trains. The first trains leaving northern Sonoma County southbound are before 5 a.m. in the morning. How many people are going to be coming into downtown San Rafael at quarter to six in the morning? Not very many. And so what they should be doing is looking out into the future to say, how do we maintain service over the variables that we don't control, such as the sales tax revenues, given that we have committed almost half the sales tax to debt service, how do we do this? And the answer is we have to start planning cutbacks in operations, particularly in those time periods when we know very few people are going to ride a train at quarter to six in the morning in downtown, to downtown Santa Rosa. Of course, you'll know in six weeks after they start if people are going to ride or not. You right. Can cut can, back then. That's what I said. We can count them. We can, but, we can, we can actually you, see. I put you in a different position now, though, here saying, now you're a director. What else do you do? And not, not to figure out what's wrong. What else do you do to make it work? Well, it, the first thing you do is you start asking staff for information that current board members have never asked them for, which is, for example, they need detailed ridership studies that have never been presented to the board so that they understand exactly how the, the fares that they recently set are going to impact ridership. They made a wild assumption that given the, the high fares that they established, they're going to get 3,000 riders a day. They're not going to get close to 3,000 riders a day. Well, Mike, you and I will probably both be on the platform the first day it runs. First day won't tell us, but maybe we'll be there the, the six, after six weeks. A little early in the morning. After six weeks, <laughs> and, uh, and we'll be there. Mike Arnold, pleasure to be with you. I've been uh, working with Mike and on and off and one side or the other side for probably 20 years. So yes. it's a pleasure to have you on uh, KRCV. Well, thanks for inviting me, Dick. I really appreciate pleasure it. Pleasure to have you on IJ Forum and, yeah. uh, and uh, hope to see you again soon. Thanks very much. Mike Arnold, it's smart. This week is our topic. I'm Dick Spots with politics and government columnist for the Marin Independent Journal.